Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of Slime Time SideQuest, an official Dragon's Den podcast. This is Platy M3. And this is Yangus the Legendary Bandit. And hey, look, we made it to 2021. Yeah, I mean, it was touch and go there for a little while in 2020, but thank goodness we've all escaped that year from hell. Yeah, 2021 is looking a lot more promising. Of course, it's still the beginning of the year, and those always hold a ton of promise, you know, good and bad. But honestly, there's no way um, anything can happen this year that'll make it worse than last year, right? Well, no. I mean, no way whatsoever. Can't happen. Won't happen. It's impossible. Unless... Unless what? Well, I mean, you remember what happened last week, right? You know, the first week of January? Oh, yeah. That was bad. It was horrible. Yeah. I'm. Uh, just to be sure that you and I are talking about the same thing, you're talking about the camera controls in East 9, Monstrum Nox demo, right? Um, no. Oh, well... You're probably thinking about the Square Enix delaying their new RPG Outriders yet again, right? Come on now, Platy. I don't even know what that is, so no. Um, the Monster Hunters Rize demo that crashed the eShop? Rise, and no. Um, we are getting another Neptunia game. Oh god, I hope not, but again, no. I don't even play those games. What do I care? Yeah, neither do I anymore. I learned my lesson, but... Okay, I give up. What bad thing happened last week that's ruining your 2021? <sighs> I don't know why. I saw a Persona 5 Strikers trailer in my YouTube recommended videos, and I was reminded that game was coming out this year. Ugh, happiness is gone. 2021 is going to suck. Ugh. Well, anyway, um, let's get some positivity going back here. Um, anyway, joining us tonight are a trio of guests who will be talking with us about some upcoming 2021 games. We're each going to be sharing uh, two different games each, just something that we're looking forward to and something that will hopefully be coming out this year in 2021 and, you know, hopefully won't get pushed back to 2022. So let's give our guests a welcome. Let's welcome back Barurian. What's going on? Blue Star. Hello. And Brother Jaybird. It's dark. Where am I? I don't know where I am. It's dark and I have no way out. <laughs> so, right. you know, you might have been expecting us to start the year with our A team, but instead we're bringing you the, bo the B team. The boob <laughs> team? The boob <laughs> <laughs> just the way my it works out alphabetically man my intellect has been insulted and i don't appreciate it <laughs> still in the dark okay, don't so, worry now, about it. so now we all need to change our avatars to ghosts on the discord <laughs> so that we can all be booze oh but um bum call back to mario episode <laughs> is that don't what worry. you said I could probably do that. Yeah, sure, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll get us started off, and I'll round it up later, but um, I, I, I may have the least amount to say for my games. Uh, maybe the last one a little bit more. But the first game is one, um, kind of goes back to one of the games that I talked about that was my favorite games of 2020 that I played, and that was Golf Story. Um, Golf Story is getting a sequel. It was supposed to happen last summer. But we got an announcement in September. There was an actual uh, really hilarious delay trailer. And I think I talked about it on the last episode. But um, there's going to be a sequel to Golf Story called Sports Story. And it looks like off the wall crazy. Um, if you never played Golf Story, it's basically Mario Golf with um, really great pixel graphics. Um, it looks like some of the coolest pixel graphics retro style that you'll see and it's just got goofiness turned up to 11 in the story and it's an rpg on top of it all so it's a goofy rpg about playing golf well the um sequel is called sports story because it just kind of opens the door for like every sport um and really the only information i have about it is uh, i was re-watching the trailer a few times last week that came out um Gosh, almost a year ago. And it, the game opens. It looks just like Golf Story. You see the uh, kid that you played in the first game. And he's, like, walking around doing some stuff. But all of a sudden, you see him just hit a golf ball like you would normally do in Golf Story. And it goes onto the tennis court. And you see the ref, like, like hey, ace or something like that. Um, and then it just gets even crazier from there. There's guys hitting tennis balls with golf clubs. Um, and another one using a tennis racket to hit it back. Uh, there's a guy bicycle kicking a volleyball, like soccer style, over a net. Uh, there's some clip of them playing soccer in the rain. 
then like the most crazy one is there is a soccer ball. The hero is kicking a soccer ball into the net or he's hitting a soccer ball into the net with a baseball bat past a full on armored knight who's holding an ice hockey stick. So total blending of half a dozen different things going on there. Um, and it ends with in you look like it looks like an army testing ground for bombs and whatever. And either that or a dump. I can't tell. There's just a lot of army guys and chain link fence there. And a dude is pitching a toaster to you and your guy swings a bat to hit the toaster. And that's about it. That's like all we know about the game so far. Um, they had a funny little delay trailer where they hinted at things like big squids, uh, golf pinball, vampires, land pirates, and a bunch of other little tidbits. But uh, this is made by a small studio in Australia. And that's, I mean, even their um, Discord, not their Discord, but their Twitter has been pretty silent since that um delay trailer came out in september so it, it looked like there's a lot there so i mean i don't expect it to get canceled but oh my gosh i hope it comes out this year i've been waiting six months for this it sounds really neat i mean you sold me almost immediately on pixel aesthetics that's that's my jam yeah yeah, I mean, and it was an easy game to play. I mean, you could do a lot of side stuff. There's side quests all over the place. Um, and even the side quests in the last one were pretty funny. There'd be guys challenging you to, like, hit golf balls into statues' heads and whatever. So a lot of trick shot stuff. But, like, the fact that it opens with all these random sports all being thrown together, I'm like, oh, my God. Yes, yes, I want to hit toasters with baseball bats. And I want to whack soccer balls with baseball bats past ice hockey nights and whatever i'm still so. like how, how how the heck did this concept come into being like who <laughs> what <laughs> i have no idea because you know, I mean, just, honestly you... other than humor the first game was just mario golf i mean it was just you know click three buttons start the timer hit the distance and get the accuracy in the middle and boom 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 you were playing golf that was it it kind of reminds me of a, like the concept of a hundred foot robot golf to where you play golf, but you're 100 foot tall mechs playing golf. <laughs> that game came out a few years ago. Oh, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah. What exists too? Who? Yeah. I mean, that just coming? sounds like a normal Sunday to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yangus is actually a 10 foot tall mech confirmed. Next week on the PGA tour. Hundred foot mech week. <laughs> That'd probably kill the green. These are five miles away camera, so you can see all the action. <laughs> well, you know they got drone footage now. You know you can just you're fine. They got the little camera that flies above the uh, NFL stadiums all the time. My sons love looking well, for that. Well, I mean when you're a giant robot mech thing like me, I mean those little drones are like flies. So you just swat them out, and I mean you get yelled at for breaking them. So true. So true. <laughs> so, I mean, I, that's all I got for Sports Story. I am looking forward to it. I'm expecting it to be as crazy in gameplay implementation as the first game was in their writing. Um, I, I, it's going to be cool to, you know, the first game was completely focused on golf, and it was still silly as anything. So this, that, that, I mean, it doubles here. You, you're getting silly writing um, with clever puns and all the stuff. But also now, like, crazy gameplay just all over the place. Perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. That's something yeah, I think everybody could use. And, and you know what? The game, the, the first game was like 12 hours. It was not something that you, and if you played one course and came back to it the next week to do another course, I mean, it's one of those casual games that you could just keep coming back to a little bit at a time. It wasn't like, oh my gosh. You know, I got to sit down and put 60 hours into this and remember where I was in the story, in the complicated story with people betraying you and whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Your caddy nice betrays little... you. <laughs> <laughs> Need to play a golf a nice game little... where, the, where it's that serious. Yeah, nice little light RPG for uh, in between the big games. So speaking of big games, Angus, you're 100 feet tall or 10 feet tall. I can't remember <laughs> what we are in this discussion at this point. <laughs> there's a one. There's some zeros. I don't know how many, but that's how it's much we're probably going to Somewhere between 10 and 100 days. feet. It depends on how close you are. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, the first uh, game, or rather the set of games that I'm going to talk about for my first um 
pick for 2021 is Shin Megami Tensei 3, Nocturne HD, and Shin Megami Tensei 5. So about four years ago when Nintendo had their big um, Switch pre-launch event that they did in Japan, they were talking about like all the different games and stuff coming out for it. Uh, one of the ones that was highlighted was that a new Shin Megami Tensei game was coming out. And, you know, a lot of people were excited for that because people were speculating if it was going to be, you know, a new mainline entry, if it was going to be a new spinoff, you know, what was it going to be? Um, and when I saw that, it was something that got me excited because I became a fan of the series thanks to um, Strange Journey on the DS. I uh, found it about through Nintendo Power, got a copy of it about two years later, just by chance finding it in a GameStop and really loved it and have played a lot of the games from the series since then. So, you know, I was really excited to hear about that. But then for about three and a half years, there was pretty much radio silence from Atlas, anything uh, Shin Megami Tensei related that wasn't named Persona. So it was kind of, you know, like, well, you know, what's happened to the game? Well, they really surprised everybody and caught us all off guard because last July in one of the mini uh, Nintendo mini directs that they had, they announced at the end of it that not only was there going to be this HD remaster of uh, Nocturne from the PS2, that was going to be coming out to the Switch, and as we later found out for the PS4, but they also finally gave us a good first look at Shin Megami Tensei 5 and announced that it was going to be getting a simultaneous worldwide release in 2021. Um, uh, Nocturne is one that it originally came out on the PS2 back in, I want to say 2003 or 2004 over here in the States, and it was one that a lot of people, if they have played it or if they've played, you know, if, RPG conversations come about PS2 game or for PS2 games. Uh, a lot of people will mention that Nocturne is a personal favorite of theirs, or they've really enjoyed the game. And it's one that I played. Um, I believe it was my sophomore year of college, if I remember right. Uh, just because I was really late to getting a PS2 and playing a lot of um, the PS2 entries in the series. But it was one that I played. It was a bit of a slower game for me, just because Nocturne is a pretty damn hard game, actually. Like even compared to some of the other ones. But um, it was one that I really enjoyed. It, it had one, it has a really interesting atmosphere to it. It's more of an, unlike some of the other games where there's characters you might come across or characters who travel with you, not necessarily fighting with you, but they'll be traveling with you and kind of give their opinions and thoughts on stuff. Nocturne was more of an isolated adventure where you were trying to discover like what happened to um, the world and why it's become this vortex world. What exactly um, Kagetsuchi, which is this giant star in the sky of this uh, vortex world you know what's that all about you know why were you chosen to be what's um this being called the demi fiend who's part human part demon and it's it's kind of like if you've played um dark souls or any of those ga games where you don't really have a lot of the answers right away but you slowly start to unravel the mysteries as you keep playing because you learn a little bit more info or you go to the right places and you meet the right people and things like that it's it's more about the journey and sort of experiencing what what it makes you feel like which is a lot different for me from playing some of the other games because Nocturne is really different in that regard with how it handles its storytelling and everything. But with the HD remastered, I was really happy to see that that was coming. Not only because it really uh, makes uh, uh, Kaneko's art style really look super good. It looks so nice. Um, he was one of the big artists for the Shin Megami Tensei series for a long time. And he has such a unique... Uh, style for drawing his characters and i really think that the hd remaster from uh, the footage that i've uh, watched it really not only makes the characters look really good but it makes the world appear very nice as well like it's one of those hd remasters where um you know the original game looked very nice too but the hd remasters make things a lot more clear uh makes models look very nice it it, it really just feels like a good transition a good way to show his art style kind of like how uh, when Dragon Quest XI came out and how that uh, 3D-wise looked like a really good interpretation of Toriyama's artwork. Um, and I'm really curious to see what all sort of changes they've made to Nocturne HD. I know recently in patches they've uh, helped out with some of the technical issues the game was suffering. And they added in um, the features for the Cathedral of Shadows. So now you can properly like select what sort of stuff your demons get instead of just like leaving it totally a chance. So I'm definitely curious to check it out on the Switch or on my PS4. I'll probably go Switch because I like having the mobility for an RPG like that. 
and I'm really curious to see to what more of the voice acting is going to be like because from what little I've heard of the Japanese version with the fiends that you have to come across and fight uh, which are one of your main adversaries throughout the game if you choose to accept the candelabra quest like they sound really cool with the Japanese voice acting so I hope that they're able to you know replicate that with the English voice actors but getting away from that one uh, with Shin Megami Tensei Five, that was another one that was coming out that looked really cool, even though we didn't really know a whole lot about it for such a long time. And finally getting to see some footage of what it looks like in-game, what the characters look like and stuff. To me, it looks like, like, yes, this looks amazing. I cannot wait to see how the game plays, you know, what the world's going to look like when we start going. It looks super cool. And what I really find interesting about Five's trailer like, it starts off with a clear shot of Lucifer in his um, nocturne design, uh, like, floating over this deserted land and landscape just with all of his demon followers and different creatures from from the vile and uh, devil races of the series. And he lets off, and he lets out the line, the god you once knew is dead. And I'm not going to lie with how the world looks and with that particular design of Lucifer being used, it almost makes me wonder if Shin Megami Tensei Five is going to be a sequel of sorts to Nocturne's uh, true demon ending that... Uh, you can get in the game, which um, without going into spoilers, basically you get that ending by completing the Labyrinth of Amala, which is a new dungeon that was added um, to the one of the original uh, PS2 releases, but it was part of our English release that we got back in the day. Uh, anyway, I'm wondering if 5 is going to be a direct sequel of sorts to that or a somewhat sequel to it, kind of like how... Shin Megami Tensei 2 uh, for the Super Nintendo was a sequel of sorts to Shin Megami Tensei 1 from one of the ending paths. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if it's going to be that sort of thing or if maybe the Vortex world happens again. You know, what exactly is going to go on? Because with the way the world is presented and how what the character looks like and what character shows up, or I don't know if it's a demon or supposed to be an angel or whatever shows up, it almost makes me think that when that character meets the protagonist character and uh, takes his hand and helps him up, from falling over from the demon attack that he suffers, it almost makes me wonder if the protagonist of Five is going to be sort of an anti-demi fiend or, or the, the the like the law version of that. There's a lot of speculation right now about Five. I am super excited to learn more about it, and I really, really, really hope that it comes out in 2021, like they've said. I would be so disappointed if it came out next year instead. I'm so looking forward to Five. I mean, I guess they've had what four years since they showed us the logo to get going so well a logo is easy yeah <laughs> but i mean a after last year and all the delays on all the different games that have happened th they must be pretty sure that they're ready to come out this year because they're doing this simultaneous worldwide right yeah that was definitely yeah. a surprise too mm -hmm. oh my yeah and i love it too that the last line you hear in that trailer too is the time for creation has come it's like hell yeah that is so shin megami tensei it's so hardcore <laughs> 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 i'm so looking forward to it like it, that was probably when that when those two trailers hit back to back like that's probably the most excited that i've been for a game announcement in a very long time like i was just so happy <laughs> well i will say that uh i know that i posted over on uh, rp gamer they asked for our gaming resolutions of 2021 and like pretty much my gaming resolution this year is play more of the longer games. I, I like have put off games uh, like Persona 5 Royal for a long time or, you know, I've done a lot of the shorter games, although I've been going in order with the Trails of Heroes games. I know the Cold Steel 2, 3 and 4 get way longer than the Trails in the Skies games and everything. So I'm pretty I'm on board with playing some more longer games this year. And th these two are definitely on my list. I probably won't be day one purchases, but, uh, you know, th these will definitely be something that if I don't get to this year, because I'm playing a lot of long games that uh, they'll be on my list for 2022. Uh, I'll play both of those. I've wanted to play Nocturne for a while. There was like three games for PS because was this a PS2? Yeah, it was originally okay. PS2. Yep. Yeah, I got rid of my PS2 five, six, seven years ago, um, and I hadn't, I, I think I'd barely touched um, SMT4 at the time, so, and hadn't played any other games in, in the SMT series, so after getting rid of it, and yeah, there's been a lot of games that I've been interested in PS2, PS3 era, and luckily a lot of them have uh, come to Switch in the meantime, so, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say it is cool. Um, just one thing I thought about real quick with Nocturne. Um, um, with the ver like with that game coming out on PS2 originally, there's technically three versions. We got the second one, which had 
uh, the Labyrinth of Amala thing I was talking about. But that one also had Dante from the Devil May Cry series as a part of it as well. He was a guest character because um, back then Conoco had did some artwork for uh, the Devil May Cry series. So as sort of a return of favor, they um, when they re-released Nocturne to sort of you know help fix some of the issues that were coming out, that were in the original Japan release, they added in Dante as a new character that would played into the Labyrinth of Amala and the new side quest stuff and the new ending that happened. But what's cool is that there was another version that re- was released around the time um, the first Raido Kuzanoha game came out, which basically just swapped Dante out for Raido. And what was so cool about the announcement trailer for HD was that it revealed that by default it's going to be, we're essentially getting the Raido Kuzanoha version, who is another Shin Megami Tensei protagonist from uh, the Devil Summoner games. I think, if I remember right, there is going to be the DLC, so you can um, uh, play the game with Dante being your sort of antagonist uh, chasing you character instead of Raido if you want to, which was cool that they were able to work that out with Capcom again to uh, get uh, Dante back into the game. So, you know, if you're like me and you've played the game before on the PS2, it's really cool that by default you can experience uh, the Raido Kuzanoha version instead and see how uh, the story plays out differently with him being sort of your antagonist chasing after you character who's trying to hunt you down instead of Dante. All right. One, well, yeah. my, my last thing about Nocturne is one thing that I don't think a lot of people really recognize. Next time you play and you get into the battle and you get into battle, take note of the phase of the moon. And for every phase of the moon, the intro to the battle music is completely different. There's a different guitar riff. It's a cool little Easter egg that most mm. people don't know. Mm-hmm. But it's it's once you do notice it, it's really cool because then you get basically eight distinctive uh, battle themes. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of really nice touches that uh, Sho- Shoji Maguro put into the soundtrack for sure, and that's definitely one of the cool ones. Brewerian, absolutely. All right. Well, Brewerian's talking to us about a uh, Nocturne soundtrack. Let's uh, continue with Brewerian. Talk about what game one of the games you're looking forward to this year. Well, so. The company Amplitude does this whole franchise that they call the Endless franchise, right? They've got about four or five games out for it right now. Endless Space, uh, Endless Space 2, um, Endless Legend, Dungeon of the Endless, and they just announced about about a month ago to the day that they have a new game coming out in that franchise called Endless Dungeon which is kind of a spiritual successor to their Dungeon of the Endless. It's a... So Dungeon of the Endless was a roguelike tower defense hybrid kind of game to where you were trying to escape a downed uh, spacecraft that had crashed on, like, the franchise's, like, origin world for their whole universe. And you're trying trying to escape the uh, dungeon from that, and you kind of did it through this whole tower defense game of it. You, you moved from room to room and you had resources and you would use your resources to level up your characters, to do random things that you could come across, so on and so forth. And you had to kind of do it with the currency that they use across all of their games, which is dust. And it's more or less carrying over into this new game, Endless Dungeon. But instead of it being a tower defense game it's still a roguelike so you know you you try to do everything in in one go um this time you're uh shipwrecked on an abandoned space station of uh, an ancient and powerful endless civilization and the only way that you can leave is to unravel the secrets of this uh space station so you kind of put together a team of heroes and uh, try to work your way out of the dungeon. Um, so they, they're calling it a spiritual successor because uh, I guess it's a kind of remake of Dungeon of the Endless, but at a later date. Um, how to best describe it? You can kind of um, do it in a one to four player in this version. I forget if the original Dungeon of the Endless had a multiplayer or not but I only ever played it single player myself. But um, basically in the space station, everything's trying to kill you. So uh, you might need a breather, look around, plan, prepare. Then you open the door to the next room and try to clear the room, right? Um, And what you're trying to do is get to the crystal that is on every level so you can continue on onward and onward through your escape. 
So what you have to do is you have to unlock doors, power the systems of the station so you can finally leave. But, you know, all of the enemies on the station are also trying to kill you, but they also want to eat that crystal. So if they kill the crystal, that's it. Your your run is more or less over. Um, there's really not a lot more information to it than that. It was since it's so newly uh, announced. I'm just kind of excited for it because the original one, like I said, it was kind of a top-down roguelike. It had pixel aesthetics. So I've had a couple friends who were kind of interested in the game, and they were immediately turned off by, I don't want to play it. You know, pixel games aren't really my thing. But with this new Endless Dungeon game, which is going to kind of play the same, uh, it's kind of 3D isometric. So think stuff like uh, Diablo and uh, other games in that kind of wheelhouse. So I think it'll be a lot of fun to do multiplayer in it. Because once they actually list it on Steam, I'll probably go ahead and pre-order it just so I can get in on it as quick as possible. But yeah, that's uh, that's more or less it as I <clears throat> run out of voice. Well, thanks for sharing with us, Brewery. Oh, that was nice of you to say that to him, Platty, because you're totally not muted right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep, not at all. No, <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> End, endless dungeon, endless voice, endless mute, you know. Yeah, so We're... so um, <laughs> at this point, they they like they announced it a month ago. It is a planned to be this year, but I could also see it not coming out until next year, knowing these guys and their very high standards of releasing their games. But mm -hmm. it'll be a lot of fun because I I enjoy all their other games as well, and everything is tied together via lore. So there's the games really aren't sequels of each other so much so you know stuff from one game will carry over but in like codex entries that you can read and photo journals of stuff that you'll unlock so on and so forth or it could just be something as simple as hey these enemies were in that game and they're also in this game that's cool i mean mm -hmm. i'm even playing a visual novel right now that takes place on another world during i think one of the games in the universe so hmm. there's a lot to unpack with them and i'm looking forward to what uh Endless Dungeon will uh, will bring forward it. Of all the screenshots I've seen of it, it looks really cool. And there's more screenshots of it than there is actual gameplay or anything because they released, a, I think, a minute and a half video on it. But like three fourths of the video is of the characters sitting in a bar and singing and drinking. So if that kind of puts the vibe into perspective, it's the song nice. sounds nice. I watched it. That's what I was doing yeah. when I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you die and you just keep going until you win. Um, as as you do with rogue like games, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know there there will probably be just like Endless of the Dungeon or Dungeon of the Endless. Uh, there will probably be a whole slew of characters that you can choose, um, ones that you have from the get go, ones that you'll find in the dungeon that you can unlock. Because like the like the past game, it was hey find a new guy in the dungeon, clear three floors with him. He's yours to choose from the start from now on and stuff like that. I mean, hell, even the first game even put in half the classes from Team Fortress 2. Nice. So you can play as like the heavy and the pyro. So right, hopefully well. something neat will be in like that. Yeah. Go check it out. It's listed on Steam, but it just says planned 2020 release or 2021 release. Mm -hmm. 2020 well. is so last year. <laughs> My game was planned 2020 release. <laughs> So we'll see how things go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. Blue, it takes two for you to talk about this game. Well, it doesn't. That didn't take... make any sense. but No, no it didn't. Uh... <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> You're missing actually... the troda of the introduction. So, I mean, let's yeah. just go for it. Oops. <laughs> all we've got right now is the engine. Okay. So the game <laughs> is called It Takes Two. Um, it's being developed by a studio called Haze Light that actually also did a game called Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, which is one that I played, oh gosh, it might have been five, six years ago at this point. Um, but it was a really cute, like, three-hour game. You know, well, I, okay, I say cute. I'll get to that later. Um, where you essentially control two two brothers. One's the big brother, one's the little brother, and they can each do different things. Like, the big brother can pull heavy thing, pull heavy boxes. Uh, the little brother can fit through small spaces, and essentially you have to co-op adventure your way to uh, essentially find some cure-all for your dad who is sick. 
Um, it's only a three hour game, but there's a lot in there that just the graphics are beautiful. There's absolutely no dialogue, but the story is it's it's really deep within there. Uh, it's the type of story that uh, it, it's a really good story, but it absolutely ripped my heart out and shattered it into a million pieces. Um, so I hesitate to recommend the game because it made me really sad, but they did it well. So I give them that. Uh, so, this studio is developing this game called It Takes Two, uh, which the is the same- most exquisite kind of pain. <laughs> they stabbed me in the heart, but they did it, like, just the right spot. It's okay, I'm still not over the story, and it's been six years, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but It Takes Two, uh, is developed by the same studio, so I'm sort of expecting a lot of a, a lot more of the same sort of co-op interaction and uh, just puzzle solving to get through all of the levels. Um, the art style seems a lot more, I want to say, psychedelic than Brothers. Brothers is very, like, uh, I want to say Lord of the Rings type setting, fantasy world. Um, but this one, there's weird colors everywhere and there's books with faces. Uh, but it, 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 just, it just seems cute and seems like a wholesome story of you know getting along with you know your co-op partner and it actually is said to have online co-op options and couch co-op which is so hard to find nowadays so uh that's all i really know about it i don't know a whole uh, there's there's not a whole lot to know but i definitely think it could be a cool little gem when it does release i was just watching that trailer and uh yeah, that looks very claymation, um, at least a little bit in the cutscene or something that I saw. And uh, yeah, I guess you had the wrong theme song for the game. I don't know. I think my theme song would work quite nice for it. Because <laughs> 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 I'm not going to lie to you with just when I was looking up uh, the video that I posted in our chat, um, when Blue started describing it as kind of psychedelic compared to the first game, all I could think to myself was like, oh, books with faces and some of that stuff. What is this, like Earthbound or what? <laughs> With like all the weird color backgrounds. So does that mean this is an Earthbound episode now? Nope. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Definitely not. Nope. This is it an Earthbound hack episode? Because I mean, don't, I'm sure don't get them well, started. You, well, funny with Blue, you talking about like the that Brothers game, like you know, making you you know feel upset and you get really heart wrenching and stuff. Just before I thought of the Earthbound thing, I'm like, God, if she ever played something like Mother Three, she would just not want to go past Chapter One. <laughs> okay, I I want to say. <laughs> I am super sensitive, but it takes a special kind of thing to actually like mess me up for years. So, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not making be... funny or anything like that. <laughs> are, you, are you inviting us to take notes? Like that, my, my comment was just more so like Mother <laughs> Three is like that's a that's that can be a hard hitting game. Like I'm not normally someone who you know gets upset or by a game as well, but like Mother Three was a game that hit me in just the right ways where it's like, oh god, this is actually really sad. <laughs> Well, getting back to It Takes Two, I was watching the trailer. Um, it does actually look pretty cool. It reminds me kind of of maybe like Yoshi's Crafted World mixed it because they the characters look made out of clay and some of the places they're in um, also looks like a mixture of like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Like I swear they're inside a computer with USB cables like snapping at them at one point or they're in like a junkyard. Um with tiny little buttons on them or getting attacked by daffodils or something like that in one of them. And at one point they're holding on to what almost looks like old Atari joysticks and they're about the size of the joystick. So that's kind of cool that they're about that size. I kind of like it when games and movies and stuff do that sort of perspective where like you're really tiny, but all this normal size stuff to us is like really giant or something you know yeah that it, it like i said they got usb cables snapping at them and it, it just looks like a regular old flower going crazy as they're running past it and yeah they're that girl's hair is definitely made out of yarn cool so yes couch co-op is always something i'm looking for uh with kids that i have uh young kids under 10 i want to be able to play games with them uh not just hand them a device and let them play forever which has unfortunately happened with Pokemon <laughs> as my son, <laughs> as my son rockets past 90 hours on Pokemon sword with a uh, net or shield. He's got 
with uh, no end in sight. Let me tell you, he's loving the fact that I bought the DLC package for him, and he's been in the tundra for ever. For <laughs> probably half of those 90 hours, he's just there. Talk about an endless dungeon or something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a pokey problem, Patty. He, he does have a pokey problem. <laughs> you know who doesn't have a pokey problem? Well, he might in a minute when he gets to his second game. But uh, Brother Jaybird. Well, you kind of you kind of caught me off guard there for a second because I was totally going to go with the second game first, and I was like, <laughs> "This would be a great setup." Thanks so much, and then you tripped well, me at that the case, finish we... line, and I appreciate it. <laughs> no, let's so let's start with a pokey problem because honestly, okay. <laughs> one of your games is a pokey problem that my wife bugs me about like every week. Like, hey, do you have new information? Hey, do you have new information? Hey, do you have new information? <laughs> well, it's, let you go it ahead. looks like the Pokemon Experience of the Year. So, um, Nintendo is coming out with a new Pokemon Snap game of all things, which was not something any of us expected coming into the uh, 2021 season. Um, Pokemon Snap, for those of you who don't know or are too young, was a spin-off released on the Nintendo 64 in which uh, you played um, a character taking a photo safari around an island. You would take Pokemon and you would present your pictures to Professor Oak and he would, depending on the quality of the photographs you gave him, would uh, rate your score and uh, give you points uh, and have those pictures added to the Pokemon report. Um, a document uh, containing data on all the Pokemon living around the island. One of the fun things about this game is while it's on, it's let's call it like, an, like a G-rated rail shooter because, you know, to a certain extent you're on rails and you're shooting things. Just, you're shooting pictures. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it's a Pokemon rail shooter just with uh, photographs instead of uh, of uh, bullets. Thank goodness, and keep Peta away for a few years. Um, <laughs> so you would be transmitted to you would start at the beginning of a course. Uh, there were about seven courses, and you would follow the track all the way to the end. And you could um, go to the, and once you finished the track, you would go to the uh, gate at the end and go back to uh, report your findings, to Professor Oak. And he would allow you to ha uh, make progress um, to the next level. Now, the interesting thing about these levels is that they in managed to f figure out a way to put in some exploration elements into the game. Um, you could, you were given tools as you succeeded and earned points for the quality of the Pokemon report. You would be given apples. Um, which would allow excuse me, you'd be given tools that would allow you to interact with the environment in different ways. That would allow you a kind of exploration uh, effect. You could be given apples to uh, lure Pokemon towards specific feature towards you uh, or pre uh, perform for the camera. You could get something called pester balls, which were little uh, throwing uh, Pokeballs that were filled with repellent gas uh, that would uh, knock Pokemon for a loop if they were hostile or flush them out of uh, hiding in certain cases or provoke a certain hostile behavior. Uh, you would get other items including a Poke Flute which could make Pokemon dance um, and you would be given all these tools in order to um, maneuver the environment and interact with all the Pokemon in different ways and uh, certain levels had special features where if you interacted with the right Pokemon in the right way, you would open up a new course. Um, so this was a, it was a kind of a, a how do I want to put this? Uh, the exploration elements added a lot of interest to the landscape and gave you a really strong sense, not simply of a, uh, of a, um, designated of a design safari but an exploration gimmick uh, um, so you had a little adventure all around the island and this game um, is definitely in the spirit of the first one uh, the opening footage actually had me confused for a second because the opening footage of the new Pokemon Snap trailer shows you a Pikachu on the beach with an apple in a way that made me double take a, um, register a double take and go, wait a minute, is this an updated version of the first game? Oh, wait, no, the environment's just a little different. Um, so this was actually pretty interesting uh, in that it's, again, it's a safari on an island, uh, possibly several islands, because um, they, they very deliberately had the word islands in plural in the trailer. Um, 
in which you again go around you get uh to take pictures of pokemon uh you get some tools for interacting with them and um there are some new updates to it the uh the graphics are um obviously much much better than anything on the original n64 uh you got your little safari bug uh that travels around the island it looks like um rather than having preset tracks there's some kind of high tech track that grows out before you i don't know if that means you can uh, change the track or whether it's just a little highlight feature to make the regular rails look fancier um there there has not been a lot of information released about this game though so uh, all we've got is, I think, maybe one trailer of any depth, and it's very interesting because it's been a, a long time since we've returned to this particular uh, spinoff, which is now apparently a genre. Um, the very brief uh, look we got at the main character does not look like Todd, um, who, for those of you who don't know, is the name of the main character from the original. He was uh, featured when Pokemon was still trying to advertise the game for the 64 he was very briefly featured in the anime for a little special uh, where he was um, he got to hang out with Ash and Misty and Brock for a few episodes. Um, and then he came back very briefly during the Johto era because that was still um, because that was still original season and they recycled a bunch of the um, more famous one off characters from the original Kano season for Johto. Um, but I haven't really seen... He hadn't really been seen since afterwards, I think. So he showed up in Kano and Johto, and that was it. This new guy is wearing a hat, which is not something Todd ever no uh, wore. So I wonder if he's a new character or just Todd with an updated look. <laughs> new Todd. Todd 2. Todd 2.0, there you go. Get it all modern-like. What's funny is I swear I've seen probably five or six episodes all year. My kids have watched ridiculous amounts of Pokemon anime this year. Um, I remember Todd. I, I actually, that's like one of the five episodes I actually sat there and watched with them. I was like, why is this guy taking pictures all the time? And now I know it. I, I remember absolutely nothing about the original Pokemon Snap, but my wife, that was like one of her top two games growing up and that and Animal Crossing. So she got her childhood back last year and it comes back again this year. Yeah, I can see that. It was one of those non-competitive um, Pokemon games, which is always nice. It was it focused a lot more on fun, uh, which would appeal to people who did not have uh, much competitive spirit in them or much hack and slash in their soul. Uh, so, you know, something nice, something fun, some neat little exploration to have. It was a good time. Snap was. Yeah, she always wanted games. She said when like her brothers would they were into everything gaming and but she would only play the games with them where her character couldn't die. So. Yeah, not not having to worry about dying is a night is a nice thing for a lot of people. <laughs> it's like because because they didn't grow up, you know, with the whole run, jump, kill the Goomba. Exactly. Uh, oh my god, survival. I died a million times. <laughs> yeah. Speaking about running and jumping and Goomba ing, what's your other game, Brother Jaybird? Oh yes, well that was that was a nice little segue. Huh? Look at that. Um, yeah, we coordinated this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, my the last one. one is another Nintendo game because I'm a I'm a Nintendo guy at heart, even if I whenever I have my problems with the company. Um, but the new one is another re is a, a remake, not a sequel. Uh, this one is for the Switch: Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. Um, which I was super excited to hear was coming to the Switch because I did not, uh, I missed the original uh, 3D World way back when for the um, Wii U. I think, did we talk about this on the Super Mario um, Slime Time? We the did. Side play? We did, yes. I remember keeping my mouth shut about that one, except to say I didn't play it. Uh, so this one is basically a um a port of 3d world for the switch um has all the same features but the advertising uh for this round uh includes the new segment on uh bowser's fury which looks um from the trailer like a basically what would happen if you took the super mario 3d world engine and made a uh, super mario 64 style sandbox which was very intriguing to me because it did it um the 3D world has its own set of power-ups and features that didn't show up in the contemporary style game for the uh, Super Mario Odyssey, which is also something I still intend to play uh, someday. 
Um, because I'm just, you know, <laughs> behind on my gaming. Yeah, stop laughing, Blue. I know, I know. I'm working on it. No, you're not. But that's okay. No, I'm not, but that's okay. Um, so <laughs> this one is actually this one is actually pretty cool because uh, the trailer, which covers a lot of the features, covers this actually very wide landscape with different features, different enemies, um, some un- some water segments. Um, looks like all just one contiguous area. But it also features, but the trailer at the uh, end also features repeat, um, I repeat shots of this super, um, super bell, uh, the power up Mario uses to enter his cat form. And it looks like the final battle because, um, the game, the trailer more or less, uh, highlights the final battle, what it looks like, uh, is a battle between a giant, um, darkened bowser with fire with what looks almost like a beard of fire um and he's faced off against by what i can only describe as a colossal super saiyan cat mario oh my god it's a dynamax battle <laughs> that's exactly what it is it's that's exactly what it, what it like. is yeah and it's got my kids are gonna love got, this oh yeah it's it's a it's a dynamax super mario battle Except Mario is in his cat form, and the cat has super saiyan uh, hair and uh, <laughs> tail fur. I think they even glow the same way, if I recall correctly. I'm watching it right now. He does glow. Oh, I didn't go back far enough. He is glowing and sparkling. There are sparkles coming off, and yeah, his hair. Yeah, super saiyan. You could describe it that way. Sonic the Hedgehog, and it's raining. There's even rain on the camera. Yeah, it's a it's a battle in the dark and the rain. That that looks like quite the epic battle. Yeah, that's probably what I would have to imagine the Bowser's Fury segment is. You go around, you go complete your little objectives like any other Super Mario 64 uh, level. And then at the very end, you get treated to a one-on-one battle with Bowser. Oh, wow, that's coming out on a couple days before Valentine's Day. Looks like a February 12th release. God, that's already in less than a month. Where does the time go? (laughs) (laughs) You're right. So feeling a little bit lonely? Get a little unlonely with some Mario. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not you a paid know, advertisement. That's, that's, oh, that's man. fanboy love there. You know, <laughs> I might have to take them up on that this year. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So, brother, at Jaybird, anything else you want to say about that? or? I'm still just kind of reeling in awe from the giant Super Saiyan cat Mario. <laughs> I just like you know, you know once you get a good look at it, it's like that's the whole experience, just like in in the in your face. So I was like, got it. This looks amazing, but got it. I, I was uh, watching that video on mute as I've been doing, as all you guys have been talking, and uh, yeah, watched him <laughs> ring that bell, and he just arose up out of the bell like big, and you know uh, he might arise many times other than just the final battle and maybe there are other games out there this year that will be about tales about mario arising or something else but blue that's my horrible segue to you <laughs> and your second game see platinum likes me more i get better segues yeah you set me up i mean blue was doing nothing there no help <laughs> i did uh, these tales are not about Mario, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> There's a crossover that could happen. <laughs> uh, so Tales of Arise is the 17th main installment of the Tales series. Uh, it's going to be, I believe, the first main one that is released since Tales of Berseria back in 2017. Um, it was supposed to be released last year for the series' 25th anniversary, but it was delayed, and I'm a bad Tales fan because I didn't know it was their 25th anniversary last year, but I played a lot of the games, so I, that's a celebration, right? Shame on um, you. Take a lap. Meh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell a tale. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting because it looks like they're moving to a new engine that they're building this game on than all of the previous ones. Uh, so I'm really interested to see how the graphics and just the worlds that they create you know, sort of evolve based on that. And the Tales series, one of the things that I love about it is just that, you know, all of the settings are absolutely gorgeous. Um, So as they, you know, keep developing, it's it's cool to see what what pretty shiny things can they put in the game next. Um, So Tales of Arise has 
two main protagonists. Their names are Alfin and Shion. Uh, and they're actually from two different planets because it's not a Tales game unless you go to space. Um, no. So one planet is a sort of medieval setting where everybody wears plate armor and carries around swords. The other planet is more technologically advanced um, and I believe Shion fights with some sort of a magical rifle. Uh, and so there's there's sort of uh, some play between the two planets and the technical technologically advanced planet. It allegedly enslaved the other planet, you know, 300 years ago or something like that. So it's going to be interesting to see how those two characters from their two different backgrounds play into one another. Um, one other thing that I thought was really interesting is that uh, playing Tales of Berseria this year, it sort of deviates from the normal battle formula for a Tales game, which all of them are a little bit different, but typically what happens is the battles take place in a 3D arena, but you essentially target an enemy and then your character will, will move along a line. Uh, so instead of, you know, going up on the TV screen, pressing forward will move you towards the enemy and pressing backwards will move you away from the enemy. Uh, Berseria didn't do that, so it was interesting to see that they plan and arise to go back to that system. Um, so we'll we'll see where that goes. Uh, but I'm quite excited about this because you know the the recent Tales games are just really really pretty, and I I'm a sucker for the kind of fantasy story that they tell. Uh, and yeah, are you going to buy all the DLC they'll eventually release with it? You need the swimsuit DLC. <laughs> I've never bought swimsuit DLC for a Tales game. I don't think I've actually bought any DLC for a Tales game yet. Yet. Oh, who knows? What kind of Maybe. Tales fan are you? Not a good one, but I enjoy them. <laughs> they make lots more money off that DLC than they do probably you buy in the game. Probably. Uh, but, you know, I can still like it. How much swimsuit <laughs> DLC do they have? I mean, that's a lot of swimsuit DLC. Well, she well, did say this is the 17th game. So uh, how many different characters? You got to think two, three each game. Times each, 16. Game has, each game has uh, typically six to ten playable characters. All right. So let's just estimate four to five times 16. So my goodness, where what is that? Oh, there was one of the 60, Tales games to 80, where... To where Female each characters? costume for each character was like five dollars for a single costume. I think it was Tales of Graces F, and the DLC ended up being like around a hundred dollars. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. what the F is for. Tales of Graces is, F F is one of my price. favorite games of all time, and I never <laughs> bought any of that DLC. <laughs> Tales that's of Graces, the, the, the company is saying when they realize that one of their favorite fans is out there not buying their DLC. F, what do we got to do? <laughs> It does look pretty, though. Wow, this game looks really good. Like, oh yeah, if you're, if you're in the den, amazing. if you're in the den thread when you're listening to this one next time, put some F, put an F in the thread. Put, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or join us on Discord and I gotta, put it in all threads. I gotta say though, I the, the the trope I'm a sucker for is for like the swordsman with like the 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 um kind of eye patch over like half the face kind of thing. I don't yeah. know why. I just really think that's cool. It's some oh, sort of he had like yeah, some his sort whole of thing. helmet, I think, but I don't know. It looked like it, and then it just like burst, and it was all gone except for the eye patch part. That was an exciting trailer. The music got me pumped. Maybe if you play Tales of Vesperia, it'll be a good segue into it. Oh yeah. Well, see, long games. That's my goal this year. <laughs> There's a long game that I have that I could do. They are I've definitely got... marathons. So, um, a friend gave me. Zestiria and Bezeria to play, so... Berseria is better than Zestiria, but I like the world of Zestiria a lot. Granted, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're kind of set in the same world mm -hmm. with, like... I think we talked about this last time, Yeah, with like, <laughs> with, like, thousands of years in between them. Uh, but, yeah. All right, well, Blue, if she was to buy all of the DLC for all of her favorite Tales games, uh, it would cost a lot. One might say it might cost as much as a King's Bounty. Boo. That, boo. And boo, when, boo earns, if we're booing, boo <laughs> if we're booing, we must be getting to Booerian. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that first R is hard. <laughs> It is Burrian, not Burrian. King's Bounty, though. What can I say about King's Bounty? It is a seriously 
old franchise. King's Bounty has been around forever and a half. It, uh, gosh, when did it come out? I think it came out somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s. It was done by the dude who eventually went on to found the company um, that made the Heroes of Might and Magic games, which oh. I believe Ubisoft owns those now. Yeah, King's Bounty was kind of a precursor to, to it. So it came out on the PC, and I remember playing a Sega Genesis version of it, like way back in the early 90s. Um, New World Computing, that was it. That's what his company was called, because they did the original Heroes of Might and Magic games, and I think Might and Magic as well. That might have been someone else, but yeah, it's been around a long time, which makes you think, you know, hey, that was King's Bounty. It's 2021. King's Bounty 2 is only now coming out, but... You know, that company went under years ago because Ubisoft owns all the rights to, like, Heroes of Might and Magic now. But mm -hmm. somewhere in the interim of the late 90s to early 2000s, uh, a Russian company called 1C bought the rights to King's Bounty. And they released a whole bunch of uh, games in the mid-2000s, like Armored Princess, Warriors of the North, Dark Side. So you got to do a whole bunch of stuff. And those these games all, if you've played a Ma Heroes of Might and Magic game, these games play all basically exactly like that. They just has a different name. But um, after doing though, it's been about it's been about five or so five or so years since the last um, King's Bounty game came out. But they decided to make an actual sequel now instead of continually releasing like new expansions or new little standalone versions within King's Bounty, and it's just simply called King's Bounty Two. But in King's Bounty 2, they kind of they've kind of gone in a very different direction with it, which is I'm, I'm pretty interested in. I lo I love Heroes of Mind and Magic, so I automatically like King's Bounty because they're one and the same. Because they have these nice cartoony graphics. It's a hex based uh, kind of map exploration game to where you have you know, you're in control of a hero. You buy units, you can stack units, and you have um, you have battles to where. You know, you've got like archers, dragons, archangels, uh, orcs, you know, all these different kinds of creatures based on the type of hero that you choose or the type of mm -hmm. like town that you have. But um, in King's Bounty 2, they're going kind of in the opposite direction of it. If you've looked up any uh, media for it, it's going to kind of have more of a realistic setting to it. Uh, so gone is the cartoony look of it and and they're i guess aiming for a, a different audience while trying to re retain their, their their user base the biggest thing about it right now is um how they're handling like terrain and map function because before if you got into battle if you ran into something on the map it would go to like a separate screen and you would get to arrange your troops and you would fight your troops based on a hex grid um but uh, now what they're changing about this game is it uh, uses a small discrete battle map of the same size, but they're keeping it on the world map this time with uh, elements based on the battle or locations added as obstacles or scenery. Um, the coolest thing about it is before, if you had an archer all the way on the other side of the map and you, you know, you hit something on the far end of the field, it would always hit, but it, you know, it might do less damage because of the distance of it. But this time they're, they're incorporating actual terrain into the battles. So you can move troops out of line of sight of stuff like that. So, you know, ranged units will have the biggest effect on this. Uh, another change that they're heading for is the how how you command your units in battle because before you could have like if you were a necromancer you could have like a stack of like 500 skeletons that would hit like a 18 wheeler when it would come in contact with another uh, unit but this time they're kind of making it more realistic so say you have a dragon uh this time you have one dragon as one unit instead of having like a stack of 10 dragons as one unit so it kind of puts things into perspective a little more. The uh, stats on it won't really change, but it'll still be uh, a big unit. They all will still occupy like this, like a single hex. So there won't be any like one hex, two hex, or three hex monsters or anything like that. And like the like the previous game with King's Bounty, you could either uh, recruit monsters from the battlefield, or you could visit uh, predetermined places to recruit monsters into your. Uh, onto your hero 
but this time they're kind of not they're kind of doing that but kind of not doing that so units will individually be able to level up now so instead of just losing units and losing attack power you can keep your you know your single unit in a single hex and then he can level up but the caveat on it this time is that you know as units participate in battle they'll level up they get new stats they get new abilities but it also has kind of a diminishing return on it so you're not rolling with the same units the whole game so that way if you know you're a casual player you can go a pretty long time if you'd like using lower level units just have kind of more of them but um, as things get harder, as you progress further into the story, you'll kind of need to replace your unit with higher level units because, you know, you could have a basic unit at its max level and then you come across a newer unit that does similar things, but almost at its base level, it's stronger than what you have now. So they kind of want you to uh, just kind of roll with your progress. But the nice thing, though, is that uh, you'll still be able to recruit things that you fight on the battlefield. So, you know, if you overpower them enough, they could be like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll willingly join you. And, you know, you can get units to add to battle. And another nice feature is that previously, whatever you had on your hero when you went into battle, everything was on the field for battle. That was it. You know, you had to fight with everything. So you could lose stuff that you didn't want to lose. This time, you'll get to choose what you want to put into battle and what you want to leave out of battle. So that'll be a, a nice little a little change for battle. So you can put specific units in that you know will do fine and leave out stuff that you kind of want to hold back on, you don't want to lose. And um, they've decided to replace kind of the isometric view that the games previously had, because, you know, it was kind of isometric, top-down, and you would just move your unit all around the field, interact with stuff. This time, it's going to be a third-person perspective in kind of a large open world. The maps will have, like, interactive objects. Now, 1C, the people who own the game now, mentioned that, like, a single map can have hundreds of points of interests. One of them that they showcased in one of their dev vlogs was, hey, you go into this village, there's a statue, and you get a prompt from the statue of something like, hey, this statue would look better if its arm was moved up. So you interact with it, and you move the arm up, and then... Like nearby, a treasure chest appears. So, hey, you found something neat on the map just by interacting with a random object. Um, that'll be a that's that'll be a nice change, but at the same time, it it feels a little different. Like I'm personally not a big fan of like open world kind of games. So uh, I've, I've been a big fan of all of the past King's Bounty games, and I'm kind of um, I'm looking forward to it, but I kind of want to see where it goes because they're they're kind of ticking a few boxes to where I'm kind of like not interested, but they've done really well in the past. And one of the biggest changes of it, other than like map stuff and terrain changes and unit changes, is they're putting way, way, way more emphasis on story and role playing. Because in the past, it was kind of a non a non thing. Like you start the game. Oh, you know, we need to get this relic, go out there and earn the relic. And that was really it. You would just kind of do your thing on the map, go fight stuff, find things. But this time, um, they are putting a very big focus on character development and story. So it really moves them to uh, major elements to share the spotlight with tactical combat. So there will be some some battles that are kind of, you know, imperative to how the story unfolds. And um, I guess lastly, with, with everything else, is they have this new system that they're putting in place with your, with your hero. Is It's called the Ideals System. And it's kind of a kind of a cardinal compass of four different ideals. And it's like power, anarchy, order, finesse. And you can earn points in all of them based on what you do in the map, choices that you make with the story. Uh, the ideals are important mechanically because your character's talents are tied to these ideals. And you'll only be able to unlock stuff if you have a sufficiently high rank in a specific ideal. Um, they're also important because it's also how you interact with characters, factions, and armies in the world. Like, if you swing more towards an anarchy, bandits are more likely to trust you. You might be able to recruit, recruit them. Um, and then if you have, you know, if you're more 
in the order side of the ideals, you'll you'll probably get soldiers, archers, and, and stuff like that a lot easier. So it's a pretty it's a pretty massive change to how the games have previously been. But I'm 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 interested. I'm interested. I don't know if any of you guys have ever played any of the King's Bounty games, considering they've they've been around for thirty thirty something years now. <laughs> I've never played any of them, but I played the hell out of the first four heroes of might and magic um i don't know if i beat any other than the first and the third completely um the third heroes the the third heroes of might and magic game is probably the pinnacle of that series too oh yeah yeah i remember i had played the original one when i was in high school and uh i went to a high school a good hour drive away i was at a magnet high school and my senior year like the second half of the year um some kid who had transferred in and by then I was driving, so I didn't really like ride the bus or know a lot of the kids where they were getting on the bus or I would have figured it out. Turned out um, two blocks away, there was an apartment complex and one of the kids that went to my high school lived two blocks away. And I, I think this is probably the only P- that, that here first game was the only like PC game I ever sat and played like hot seat with. And he'd get up and we'd he'd come over and we'd play that. But then a little bit through college, I remember just killing some time at Target one day um waiting to go over and tutor somebody and ran across like a box set with like one through four in it years later and yeah like that i think that might have been all i played for like most of a 2000 maybe whenever maybe it was only the first three or something but yeah i love those games and over the past year i've kind of been chipping away a little bit uh the brave land trilogy is very much like this yeah, so it, you it's very those. short I, though compared to like if you played any of the one C King's Bounty games, they they play the exact same. It's mm-hmm. it's King's Bounty Two is going to be such a massive change that um I'm not yeah, quite what you sure were how I was like, geez, that's not sounding like what. <laughs> yeah, they're they're going in a completely opposite direction. I feel like with this and. It looks really good by all because I've watched several of their dev blogs that they've done on this game so far, and everything looks real cool. Like I'm really interested in the battles with um, terrain changes because before it was it, it, a lot of the times if you don't plan accordingly, the battles will very quickly become battles of attrition. Like who's going to wear who down first? But now mm-hmm. there's going to be a little bit more uh, tactic in how you do stuff. So. So with the whole train change thing and the whole how they're handling unit stacking, it's going to it's going to be different but not different at the same time. I'm just I will say that I I will look forward to not running into issues of late game stuff. You run into a random uh mob of creatures and it's really like a stack of 500 dragons and you're just like, "Well, crap." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's not much else you could say at that point. Yeah, because you can run away, but you'll lose units doing it, and you know the unit will stay there and continue to increase as the game moves on. So, I'm just the biggest the biggest turnoff for me so far is I guess the how they're leaving the old style of graphics behind, and going more for a realistic open world because open world is one of the boxes I tick of not interested usually mm-hmm. oh yeah that the, the trailer looked very western rpg yeah open worldy yeah well, like, I, that, I mean was... i mean eastern because the russian <laughs> eastern western definitely not jrpg yeah definitely not JRPG. and it, this has never been anything yeah, close no, to a none of them have yeah so all right I, okay. I suggest if you're interested in king's bounty and the king's bounty 2 is not looking like anything you'd want to play Go play the first ones. They are all, they are almost always on sale and pretty well priced on Steam. I was gonna say they're probably on GOG. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I might have one of them via G- GOG. God, knowing yeah, knowing a uh, old game. You could probably hard. get like the original King's Bounty because it was originally a PC game. Oh, there there is a bazillion King's Bounty. Oh, look at that King's Bounty. The Legend is a buck fifty right now. Go I was going to say, as we're recording, I, I usually get these up pretty quickly. They're all seventy seventy five percent off. Go try one it out. Like. They're all they're all good. And for less than a cup of coffee, you can have yourself a whole new game to play. Yeah, they're, maybe they're a whole fun. new genre. All right, we got a couple games left, and uh, as we ease our way towards the ending of this, uh, Yangus 
get you back on here to talk about your second series game that you want to talk about. I'm glad you brought back that joke from the Vita episode with the eased segue. I got booed for doing so silently. Yep. Not by me. I I, I appreciate a good callback. So. <laughs> Boo! There it's not um, silent anymore. <laughs> But uh, the other game that I wanted to talk about was uh, Ease 9 Monster Nox. Uh, the game, I believe, originally came out in Japan last year or maybe late 2018. I, or, like, excuse me, late 2019. I don't quite remember. But um, Is this going to be an East game that's released on a system that nobody plays and then five years later will get released on a system everybody plays? Because that's what East likes to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, uh, fuck, what was I going to say? Uh, Ease 9 <laughs> is the uh, latest entry in the series. Um, like the other games, it follows the adventures of Adol Christian, and it looks like in this game it's going to be about the time where he and uh, Dogi are traveling together. I can't say chronologically where it takes place. I've been trying to keep myself in the dark about this game as long as I can, or as long as I've uh, known about it. But essentially what I know is that in Ease 9, uh, Dogi and Adol are continuing their travels across the land, and they end up getting in a situation where they're falsely accused of a crime, and the two of them end up getting arrested. Uh, Adol ends up getting freed by this mysterious woman who recruits him from just, again, this is going off my understanding, uh, recruits him to join this band of a ba- this band of hers that are trying to help protect this uh, prison city that is being attacked by monsters. Uh, these people that she's recruited are, I don't know if they gain these powers naturally or if it's just a, something that she ge- has given them, but basically all the members are able to use different, like, strengths of animals in order to help them out, like Adol, for example. Uh, he ends up getting the strength of alliance, so he's able to... Uh, his appearance, he, his red hair that he has, it starts, uh, gets a little longer, looks a little more unkept, almost like a mane of sorts. Um, he is able to, like, leap tall buildings. Uh, there's another member who joins who ends up getting, like, the strength of an ox so she can, you know, break down walls and do some other stuff like that. I, again, have not been really fo- trying to follow too much about this game because I want to go in fresh with it. But if I had to guess, and from what little I've seen, it sort of follows what, like, ease memories of Salsetta and, um... Uh, Lacrimosa of Donna did, where there's six playable characters. Um, two of each will have a different sort of attack ability, like Adol will probably have Slash, and another character will have Slash. Two will have Blunt, two will have Pierce damage, and you know you gotta sort of customize your party, get them all fed up so everybody can uh, handle different situations depending on the monsters. Uh, what I do know is that they've added in new mobility options and new ways to explore, since that's one of the big components of the E series is exploring uh, the new areas that you go to, because how it usually works is that the areas that you explore are then written down and put into note form uh, via Adol's journals from his adventures. Uh, but what, from my understanding, with these abilities that they gain from this monstrum power, which is what you know essentially gives them these animalistic qualities and strengths and things like that, um, they're then able to you know leap tall buildings or you know latch on to different areas to climb up to that you normally wouldn't be able to access. So they're taking sort of what um, Lacrimosa of Donna did, uh, which was Ease 8, uh, which had much bigger environments and different ways you could explore them, but they're really, like, you know, amplifying that and, like, trying to improve on those strengths. I've heard apparently that the camera controls are a little wonky, which probably has to do with more of the verticality to the game and the exploration stuff. But, you know, it's hard to say if, you know, this demo that's out right now for the game is using... um, um, if it's using, you know, just based off of the original Japanese release before, you know, got any updates or anything. But, you know, I'm sure it's something that's going to get a little, you know, different and used to as well. Because some of the monsters that I've seen, like, they are huge. Like, from past games that I've played of the East series where a boss monster is usually huge, like, some of the regular enemies that looks like they're in the game from trailers, like, they look big. Like, you got, like, big goblins and trolls and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. So it, it definitely looks like, you know, Falcom is really trying to, you know, push what they can do with the games or with the series excuse me and i think it helps too that since this game was originally ps4 that um since it was originally a ps4 release that they were able to do a lot with the system a lot better because they had stronger hardware like versus when they were mainly developing on the vita or the ps3 like simultaneously or when uh they were just mainly like trying to get stuff released on the vita so I'm I'm guessing it's going to be kind of like what the PS4 version of Lacrimosa of Donna was, where you know it's got you know smooth 60 frames per second the whole time. You know everything has this really nice crisp look to it. The graphics 
and the character and colorization and everything is going to look really nice and that the gameplay is going to feel very you know it might be a little weird at first but you know if you're not used to an ease uh, an ease action rpg game but like if it's like the other ones i'm sure it's going to become like second nature like only after you know like a few minutes of playing it so i'm definitely looking forward to seeing what exactly happens with ease nine monstrum Knox, and you know what's going to happen to dogi in this situation are we going to see um sort of the castaway village sort of situation like we saw in uh ease eight where we're going to have like a big village we can set up and everything or if it's just going to be you know, focusing on Adol and his group, because, you know, even if it is just that case, the one thing that Falcom usually does do pretty well is characterization. And even with like the small cast of always changing characters in these ease games, they're always, they always do a pretty good job fleshing everybody out and like having good group dynamics with everyone in the party. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what that game will be or what that game will have in store, both uh, from playing other ease games and what it's going to do to sort of evolve the formula. And I've believe it's planned to release this april on the ps4 and sometime later this year on the switch but i'm probably just gonna go with the ps4 version because i, I kind of like playing falcon games on my ps4 and just sit you know just sitting down and you know getting relaxing in my chair and playing them so i'm definitely looking forward to that unlike me who plays all my falcon games on my vita <laughs> i just think about playing them and i never actually do <laughs> I, I played, uh, what is it, Zero no Kiseki, and that's what the one I talked about was my game of the year that I played last year. And I was like, okay, I, I've, I've gone pretty hard with Falcom and The Legend of Heroes, so I'll, I'll do something else uh, waiting for the next game that I'm about to talk about that uh, Yangus and I will be playing at the end of February. Um, and then, no, I'm right back into AO no Kiseki, the second Crossbell game. I'm like, ah, it's a duology. Why, I can just knock off the two back to back. I'll be fine. So, no, Falcom makes some good stuff. Yangus has been unable to ease me into the ease games, but maybe one day <laughs> when I don't have other 100 hour RPGs to play. You'd probably enjoy uh, Lacrimosa of Dawn if you were looking for one to try out. The Vita version does play pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's something I should probably try. I know I tried Origins and bounced off that pretty hard after yeah. about three or four hours. That one I know is that's not... pretty different. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understood that. It was. I think it was just I'd, I've got a few of the games on the Vita, and I was like, oh well, you know, Origins that comes before one and two. Why don't I try Origins? And yeah, the first boss, I was finally done with it. I was like, nope. <laughs> I, I was lost getting to the first boss, and then I couldn't do it. I was like, no. I'm not good at games, <laughs> these ARPGs. But well, you've tried out it, more of them lately, so you might do better if you went back now. <laughs> yes, I have. You're right. I have. Gosh, it's amazing when I look at like the games I beat last year, and I'm like, holy crap, that's like that was half action. My reflexes are getting better in my <laughs> old age. Maybe not in my knees, but in my thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, Nino Kuni Two was your warm up for action RPGs. Now, when you go to a Yeez game, you're like, I'm ready. Let's do this. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I loved that one. Uh, speaking of Nino Kuni 2, uh, we should mention that our resident Nino Kuni 2 hater, um, not on our episode tonight, but a uh, good old Drippy, who he's been giving it a good, giving it the old college try the second time around with it and having a much better go of it. Although I think he's uh, got a little bit other stuff on his plate. Congratulations, Drippy. Drippy Slime Star. Did I say that right this time? I always say it backwards, but. That's why I always go with Drippy. Congratulations on the birth of his first child. So, congrats, Drippy. You have uh, leveled up your family. And with that, I'm going to talk about my next game because I, I always chat with him about this series. I very much linked to the birth of my last son because my first kid slept through the night, like, day two, day three, very easily. Second kid was, and still is a problem. We started recording a little bit later tonight, mainly because I was trying to lay in bed and get this five-year-old, almost five-year-old to sleep. But uh, back when my second child was born, uh, I'd take a nice two-hour shift in the middle of the night, rocking him to sleep, letting him just sleep in my arms, and I would always be playing for, like, months on end the Bravely Default games. I played Bravely Default and Bravely Second back-to-back, -back, put in 120-some hours between those games. Um, probably a lot more than that, but... Um, and very excited that this the end of February, Bravely Default 2 is coming out. And uh, we'll have to have a spoiler quest on this maybe in April or may yangus even if it's just us but uh this is going to be yangus and i's pretty much annual game competition where we uh both start a game on the same day and 
see who completes it, which has yeah, been, uh, be like, oh, sorry, go <laughs> ahead. I was going to say, maybe it'll be the first time we actually complete a game in the same year. <laughs> we, we've had a, uh, troubled, troubled history with this. Like we'll, we'll both be going and one of us will just completely fall off the game or completely fall off the series. Um, Yangus did come back around and finish one. There's two games in a row that I did not come back to though. But, uh, I think it, Judging from this so far, what I've played now, both demos, um, there was a demo, gosh, what was it, April of last year? Um, yeah, I believe. Somewhere I, around yeah, there. Yeah, it must have been because that was around the time where I was off for two months from work because of um, the COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was it was sometime between probably mid-March, mid-May uh, last year. I remember doing it. I wrote an impression about it for RP Gamer. Um, at, I liked it. I know you beat the asterisk holder. I did not in that one. Um, the difficulty was cranked way up and it said that right in the thing is like this is supposed to be on hardware this is on hard mode so play the demo learn some things give us some feedback and they changed a lot of stuff um, a lot of uh, like, I think fonts and colors and accessibility stuff just little things um, pretty much but I did sit down this week with the second demo it's been out for a couple weeks now I didn't want to play too much in it because it um, it's five, you get to play for five hours in the second demo, and it starts you off, I think, right after. It, it kind of prefaces it. There's a party of four, four main characters like the other Bravely games, um, all new this time. And it prefaces it with saying, like, oh, we're starting you in the game when the party's all together. So my guess is a lot of, like, JRPGs, you'll probably spend a couple hours meeting and getting a party together. But then this pretty much dumps you in the same area that the first demo was. And I, I I just did a couple, maybe a dozen battles and just walked all around and went into the uh, area a little bit just to get excited for like, ooh, I can't wait, I can't wait. Um, but I didn't want to, I didn't even want to talk to any of the characters really that would be story related. I, I did a side quest and that was about it. I didn't go where the little marker was showing me to go to complete the main quest because I didn't want to hear anything about the main quest. Um, it's it felt very bravely default. It felt very bravely default. Um, it's got some kind of like Octopath Traveler feel to it as well. That's great to hear, actually. Yeah, it it, it, it feels great. The battle system, I think the biggest change is um, kind of like what Dragon Quest XI did, where you pick your commands and you go instead of, you know, picking all your commands and then the turn starts and everybody goes based on their action. Um, it, it, they went kind of how Dragon Quest switched for Dragon Quest XI, and the second you pick your command, you go, which is what all the Legend of Heroes games I've been plowing through hundreds of hours do, so that was good to see. Um, it definitely felt a little easier. I played on normal difficulty, so it felt a little easier than the demo, although there were still times where I would just like run into a trash mob, and there'd be like eight monsters, and I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> and it, you're, you're still at the beginning of the game, I think all my people had their jobs. Um, it looked like they all had um, primary jobs set to level six. Um, you could earn job points, but I didn't fight enough battles to level those up at, at all. So they had some skills available to them, but like nothing really like huge area of effect or anything. So, I mean, it was all taking out those eight people one at a time. Um, the spells you could set to, you know, cast fire on one person or have the fire affect everybody for lesser damage to everybody than a single area. Um, I always found that was pretty cool, that if you want your single person spell to be an area of effect, you could. Um, uh, everybody had weaknesses, and you could see the weaknesses were popping up like, as people were attacking them and hit them with a weakness or hit them with a resistance. It would pop up, and you'd, then you'd be able to learn it from then on. You'd know that about the enemies. Um, Kind of going with the uh, uh, Yangus talking about a couple SMT games, the Shin Megami Tensei, uh, physical attacks, physical attack abilities, um, like low kick or something like that, uh, cost HP to use instead of always pulling from your MP um, pool. And it really seemed like a lot of the mage casters and everything had some skills that allowed them to regain. They could rest and regain MP or use an ability to help somebody else regain MP. I was like, wow, I was surprised 
how many different and it might have only been two or three available out of four characters but still that was like holy cow coming from dragon quest nothing restores mp really um so that was good to see the battle has four different speed abilities to it which when i cranked it up to the fourth one i was like okay this is too fast i don't even know what i love Uh, i love it at like penultimate speed when you're just trying to you know grind up a level or two Oh, yeah. I could definitely see using that like later on when I have some area of effect stuff and, you know, when I'm a little bit more used to the battle. But in the first 12 battles, I was like, uh, did okay, I got to I, I think I, I got to go double said, speed, not four time. I think I missed if you said that. But can you still like in the first game plan out your uh, like save save a kind of uh, memory layout of what you did in, in the previous battle and just kind of apply that forward? I believe so, because I was going through the settings menu, and there's a lot of stuff in the settings menu that you can do, and uh, I think it's got the cursor memory, yes. So, like, in Bravely Second definitely did this, but you could all, you know, you could put in, you know, I want I want character one to do this, two to do that, three to do that, four to do that, oh. and you could just kind of save that as a preset, right. and, then, and then you get into battle, and it immediately does it. And I would do that so I could, you know, do like yeah. grind up job points and stuff. That I don't know. I wonder if they do have that because that might be difficult to do since you're picking attacks one at a time. Oh, so you're not braving or defaulting? Oh, you can. You can brave and default. But um, like once you set your character's attack, he does it. Even you're not he, doing so. Oh, that's you're, you're not doing round by round. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, more like the Dragon Quest 11 thing like Platy was talking about where. Gotcha. You know, it's, it's I all guess about I wasn't... how fast you are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess I wasn't following that very well. Okay. okay. That makes sense. All right. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. A um, couple of just little things that I saw. Like I said, there are tons of things to do in the settings menu. You could change the difficulty anytime. Um, I don't remember if I saw an, in- an encounter rate slider. That was always fun in the Bravely Default games. Um, finding in that area that had like some really good monsters that gave good EXP that you could beat easily. Having that battle system set up and then turning the encounter rate way the hell up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the monsters are on the field this time, so you can oh, see okay. what you're doing. And you can swing at them to get a uh, if Preempt. you hit them before. Yep, It gives you all a brave point. Oh, that's nice. Point. So yeah, everybody starts with a point. See what what I love that they did in Bravely Second was uh, in, in lore entries. The more you, the more enemies you, of a type that you defeated, the more kind of lore that you got for that care for that enemy type. Yeah, that was a cool feature. I like that too. I'm gonna guess that's here too because I I kept beating up the same guys more and more, and I did realize by the end I might use an analyze spell on one of them too just to see it. Somebody had that. My white mage I think had that. Um, but yeah, there was a lot there. That wasn't there initially by some monsters. Um, the water effects, I mentioned this in my thing a year ago when I, the impression, I really, the water effects were awesome. Um, just seeing it on the field and everything. And the voice acting all sounds really good. And I tell you what, there's uh, two women, one's the default white mage, it looked like. Um, they made her as, there's your hero, protag- main protagonist guy, blank slate kind of dude. Um, and then there's Elvis. And I, I don't you know what it, you mean. Ring a bell? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the ring a bell this time is Elvis. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The and, characters definitely all take inspiration from the uh, folks from Bravely Default. But sorry, I'm glad you go ahead first. Oh no! Yeah, that's no. They, they definitely do. So the ring a bell equivalent this time is Elvis, and he's the tallest player, and he just looks very. I mean, I know they change costumes uh, with all their different jobs, but he looked so like Zorro esque. Um, and his black hat and slick beard and everything. And his voice actor is awesome. He's totally Scottish, I believe. <laughs> That's great. But it, it just all does, like, it, to me, like, I expect him to look like Yangus or something like that. And you just have, like, this, it, the way he looked didn't fit his voice. There was a, and with the name, and I think it's the name Elvis, too, that really gets to me. Like, okay, <laughs> this isn't just like some random name. The name Elvis has some very definite connotations. You don't just say Elvis and like, oh, hi, I'm Elvis. That's my name. You know, everybody's going to be like, what? Oh, Elvis. Oh, hey. Let's have a blue Christmas, you know. Let's and, have a blue Christmas, mama. Yeah. That was that was more Bill Clinton than Elvis, I think. That, 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 that I do not been. know what you are talking about. I am Elvis. <laughs> But like, there's a definite disconnect by looking at the character, thinking his name's Elvis, and then hearing that Scottish accent. I think I'm going to have to find a trailer for this. 
Yeah, I, I mean, all of, anything for Bravely Default too. Yeah, all of it individually was fine, but like, I'm like, I just keep thinking, like, this is Elvis. This is Elvis. Why is Elvis talking like that? That no, no, that's not. <laughs> So yeah. whatever, I'm sure I'll get used to it. You're gonna hear it enough. It, like I think pretty much all the lines were voiced. Then again, I didn't go very many places. I started maybe two cutscenes in the whole thing. So um, God knows, like, like this is gonna be a long game. So who knows how much is voiced? But all the actors sounded very good. Um, I mean, this is a Square Enix title. They, they're not gonna. It, it's not gonna have a lot of cheap stuff on it. But oh yeah, they'll go all out definitely. Unless yeah, it's Trials yeah. of Mana remake and everybody sounds super cheesy. <laughs> well, there is that. Don't so. get me started on that. Don't get me started on that. I guess we got to have that caveat on there. But Bravely Default seems to be a little bit more of their baby. Um, at least the studios that do these games and Octopath. Um, so, no, I, I'm very excited. Yangus, I am really I'm pumped to uh, race you or at least uh, stay right beside you or quite far in the dust um, when you take a day off of work and put in eight hours. And I'm like, yep, that's the end of that. <laughs> but yeah, we'll I will see. finish. I will finish. If I finish yeah. at the same month of you, I will uh, I will consider that a uh, heck if we both finish before something else big comes out like in April or May. I think that's. That's the real victory for us. We yeah, finally well, found one. Yeah, and the weird thing is, too, like, this is the first time where we're doing a race where um, it's actually a game from that year because all the other ones we've done have been, uh, like, past year releases or in, um, like, when we did Sweet and you know, that was several console generations <laughs> ago. So Yeah, what, we've done <laughs> Sweet Kid. <laughs> we've done Trails in the Sky. We've done... Um, was it Romancing Saga 2? So, yep. yeah, we, we, we've gone way in the past. And all of these were pretty much like our first forays into those respective series. So uh, this time we're we're coming back to a game that we know we like the series. Did you say that the so the demo starts you off like after the parties together? So it's like the original demo for the game. Yeah, to be honest, I think it's the exact same city as the original demo. I think it's uh, the okay. exact same area, um, but you get to play for five hours. So like I said, I. I walked around i battled a little bit to see what was different there um i went in the town and i you know i probably could have done it again because it was yeah I, I think it's the same town okay. uh, but i just went in i saw some guy doing jester or he was a minstrel singing and i know he's got the minstrel uh asterisk because he flat out said it so Oh, it's cool they added that and then to the new demo. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that was not in the first demo. I don't believe at all. Yeah, and yeah. that was me walking the other. Uh, the, the, I think the uh, that town basically there's two directions, two main directions you can walk, and I walked specifically away from the quest marker for a main story. <laughs> Just slowly like, back away from the minstrel. <laughs> and I was like, I'm I'm not going to go to the main story, but no, that's when I ran into the minstrel. He was on the other side of the town, and I had a whole cutscene with him. <laughs> He's like talking to all the people and singing to them and doing all this stuff. I was like, oh, but he wasn't he wasn't a good minstrel. He he, he they were complaining to him and he minstrel sang them away with their complaints and they all walked away. But I, I like even on the away. side, I, I, I will have to say I love games with uh, signposts, big, bright signposts that even I can't miss. Um, I started side quest number one, um, and side quest number one was somebody wanted three shiny shells from the beach. And when I went back out into the overworld, there were literally three markers that I could just walk up to. Oh, you hmm. found a shell. Yo, you found a shell. I did okay. notice though in the menu, um, you could turn that off. Oh, so okay, cool. Turn off. Yep. If you want to turn off stuff like that. Um, if you don't want the big shiny signpost telling you where to go, um, I don't know if they differentiated between main quest and side quest in the ability to turn it on and off, but they were different color. I think it was a little blue arrow pointing to the main quest area or side quest was yellow or vice versa, but it was pretty clear which was the main quest and which was the side quest when I had both going on. So Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask yep. if you could um, change that or not. Cause I, I kind of yep. like with these games that... You've been able to, you know, if you want the markers, that's great. But if you also just kind of want to have more of the, you know, just kind of explore to your heart's content, you know, see what you can find sort of thing. I'm glad they have that option. So it's good to hear that they have that back, too, for this new game. Yeah. So um, I, I know, what is it, Xeno, you were talking about it, the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. A big thing that everybody loved about that, since that game is full of side quests, is wasn't there like a line that'll take you right where you need to go? 
with the side quests for the, that game? Yeah, um, you can freely activate... Uh, well, okay, so if you take a side quest from a character, uh, you can then uh, go into your menus, or it'll automatically do it for you, too, where it'll always have that particular character highlighted, or if you need to you know, fight certain enemies, it'll... Um, like, say you have to get... Uh, a, p- a bug piece from these flying insects around Colony 9. Like, those particular uh, enemies then will have, like, a little blue exclamation point in their name, so when you're walking around and you go past them or you target them, it's like, oh, okay, cool. That's any man I need to try and hunt then to, you know, to get the piece I'm looking for. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, that's my, uh, those, are, those are my two big games. I know there's other stuff that'll come out. I'm sure that'll grab my attention, and I'm, I'm definitely interested in, uh, your your two SMT games and definitely I'm sure I know I'll be buying Pokemon Snap for my wife and playing it. Uh, looking, I hadn't even looked at Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser Fury, but that'll definitely be something I'm sure I'm buying for the kids. And of course, I'll sit along and play with them. So uh, and I'll have to check out the other ones. It takes two. Definitely piqued my interest being couch co-op. I'm looking super forward to uh, Endless Dungeon for sure. I'm curious with them. Um just because we were talking about Bravely Default 2, I'm really wondering if the Adventurer is going to come back in some form, because, um, like, all the games that this team has made that have done, like, the Bravely games, and, like, even when they did Final Fantasy, the four Heroes of Light, like, there's always been the Adventurer character that's popped up in them, and, like, at the end of Bravely Second, there's a bit of a surprise reveal for that character. But they haven't shown if if the Adventurer is going to be in Bravely Default 2, so... I'm really curious if that character is going to make a comeback somehow. I'll and bet you Platy's he does. going to get mad at this character for reviving people who died. <laughs> Every fucking asterisk person is going to come back alive. <laughs> that that goddamn minstrel that I've already seen. I know I'm going to have to fight him at some point to get that asterisk. And then I know I'm gonna, he's never going to be gone. <laughs> Don't worry. Just blame the adventurer if something happens to him. <laughs> <laughs> all righty on that note i'm gonna wrap that up for this episode of slime time side quest want to thank everybody our b team here brewery and blue star and brother Jaybird, for joining us to talk about their uh favorite games that they're looking forward to in 2021 well if they if they actually come out if both they come of mine out. Are, <laughs> both of mine are planned 2021 releases but we'll actually see if that happens but Maybe still you talked about the games pending maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> pending <laughs> <laughs> if not, yeah. maybe I'll finally buy a Switch and play Bravely Default 2. Get Burry yeah, in a Switch should. 2021. <laughs> An Octopath Traveler. Oh, yes. I guess yes, you could okay. get that on PC. That's true. I don't want to play it on my PC. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot of RPGs and plenty of other good stuff that's going to be coming out this year. And, you know, hopefully, like we said, that nothing will get delayed again and nothing crazy else will happen. And,. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of other stuff we did not talk about that's coming out that looks pretty cool for 2021. Like, um, like another one that I'm excited for is King of Fighters 15, which we finally got to see some information about that. Oh yeah, I, I'm sure there's some other Nintendo games that I'm not thinking of, and some other like PC. Ga- you know, I'm sure there's tons of stuff that we didn't talk about tonight. But you know, this is just kind of scratching no. the surface on what's personally interesting or per- Every- personally interesting to the five of us that are on here tonight. Everything we talked about is all that's coming out this year. <laughs> you all Sorry, get guys. 11 games, period. That's all you get. <laughs> it's yeah, 1990 I mean, I, all over again. I would have talked Rune Factory 5, but I don't see that coming out in English this year at all. Like, I'm excited for that game, but it's not out in Japan yet, so that that's not coming out in English this year. But that's a game for me to talk about on SideQuest, you know, 53. Yeah. <laughs> Until then. Until then. You might have noticed that the only time we mention Patreon is when we say we don't use Patreon. We're just long-term fans that want to speak about the topics, the games, and stuff that we know and love so much. If you have any money you'd like to donate, consider sliding on over to the Dragon's Den at www.wudis.com den and click on support this site. Wudis has owned and maintained the Dragon's Den DQ fan site for over 20 years and would, I'm sure, appreciate any donation. Or you can use his Amazon affiliate links. Pretty much anything brand new that you can buy off Amazon, he's got affiliate links there, too. Um, and a doesn't cost you anything, but a small fraction of that sale will go to support the den. 
Uh, if you have any suggestions for a future side quest episode, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, you can reach out to Platy via his Twitter, platym 3 or on the Dragon's Den official, unofficial Discord. Um, if you, you can also contact me at Yangus the Legendary Bandit on the Dragon's Den via personal message, or you can message me on the Dragon's Den Discord as well. Uh, we have a list of ideas that, you know, we've been taking um, episode idea or episode topics from. And if you uh, message us, let us know what uh, topics you'd like us to cover or maybe revisit something, we'd be happy to add it to our list. Or, you know, if it's something you want us to talk about again, we will, you know, think about returning to that topic, maybe with some new guests to get some new opinions. Bye, everyone. Side quest complete. Mm-hmm.